our intuition was okay so some sort of parallelization should happen with the like those kind of sharding and proof of stake was intuitively the desire that we should approach and everybody said no it's not doable if we take the blockchain trilemma from vitalik that you cannot achieve scalability security and decentralization without compromising any of those without charting i, I always envision that ethereum would eventually define a standard where all of those headers or data that is being pushed into the box into the ethereum beacon chain will kind of get synchronized across the l2s you kind of built a, a some sort of a trustless finality model across synchron synchronized across all the l2s if you would apply the same l run or multiverse x uh, model to the ethereum case the only problem is welcome to epicenter the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix Lutsch, and today I'm speaking with Lucian Minku, who is the co-founder and CIO at Multiverse X. Multiverse X, previously known as Elrond, is a fully sharded blockchain network and ecosystem. Before we talk with Lucian, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis Chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Hi, Lucian. Welcome to Epicenter. Hey, hey, Felix. Uh, pleasure to be here. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so glad to have you. I think, yeah, you've been in the space for a long time with Elrond previously, now, now Multiverse X. I think there's like a lot of stories you can tell about proof of stake, about uh, what you've been building. And, and so, yeah, we wanted to basically just start there. Like, how did you get into crypto and, and started building like uh, Elrond and now, I guess, Multiverse X. Definitely. So first thing first, uh, thanks a lot for the invite. Thanks for hosting me, Felix. Uh, by the way, big, big congrats and respect for the entire Epicenter team. I think uh, Epicenter is perhaps the, the podcast where I learned most of the crypto stuff in my entire life, like in the entire career. So I've been following uh, ever since I met Sunny in 2017, just to give a brief context, uh, how, how I discovered Earth Epicenter, then uh, uh, then we'll, we'll move to to my background. But actually, I met Sunny in uh, Zug into one of the very early crypto conferences. He was uh, uh, presenting Cosmos ecosystem, and it was prior to mainnet. Uh, I think it took one one and a half years after, if I remember, uh, after Sunny mentioned. Uh, just it's, it will follow very shortly. Cosmos Lodge will be very shortly, and uh, immediately actually I fall in love with with a lot of the stuff that uh, that you guys were were presenting. And uh, m more than happy, as I said, big congrats. And uh, maybe the second point is 
I have not, uh, just to uh, upfront disclosure, I have not did any podcast in the last uh, seven years since uh, I built uh, uh, or started uh, Elrond. And then uh, the, the main reason actually why I'm here is after listening to your, one of the latest uh, podcasts from, from Epicenter with Paolo Arduino, where he mentioned, um, uh, we, we all as tech, technical founders thought, okay, we are going to build s- such good products that we, the products will speak for themselves. Uh, and then that was my, my life thesis that if uh, everything went for seven years, six years, uh, and only with Elrond not, not going out, then basically once I hear, heard his story and how important it is to go go out, uh, yeah, I decided I'll reach out and uh, here I am. So just uh, a short into a big, big uh, respect for the entire Epicenter team. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much. That's that's such a yeah, great anecdote. I think, yeah, and we're super glad to have you and honored uh, to be uh, chosen as the, the first. I think your project obviously is technically uh, like one of the very advanced uh, sort of blockchain infrastructure so it is only fitting <laughs> that you you come on epicenter to dive into it but yeah i guess yeah let's let's start there how how did it start or when did you sort of come up with the idea of like elrond back then and now multiverse and, and how has it changed if if at all or what was like the yeah, goal yeah, yeah definitely so uh it's so, some context I've, uh, I think uh, Benjamin, my brother, was uh, was the, the hook for me into the Web3 ecosystem I've been building uh, and have technical background, have built uh, uh, several startups in Germany, has lived the, I think, the last 10, 12 years in Germany there, uh, building the, all kinds of infrastructure projects for the German states, for startups, for large scale, uh, large scale enterprises and so forth, and was very passionate about a very simple logic of every uh, protocol standard like from tcp udp and all that kind of stuff going to BitTorrent and uh, that kind of uh, uh direction so i think for me it was very very uh important to to try to uh, uh connect to something that i could relate and understood very simple but i could draw it like the protocol design on the whiteboard right so once you take like that and you just remove for example from BitTorrent the cedar part you immediately see oh uh, that that's the bitcoin uh, pretty much topology of the network ah aha uh-huh. so basically it clicked it clicked it clicked and then uh my brother uh, uh, uh tried to he he was already involved in uh i think nam uh, uh one of the core core team members at nam and i think on the bitcoin talk forum and so forth very 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 all all days and then Every time he had uh, all, all this kind of uh, task or or challenges to 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 solve, he flew to to Germany over the weekend, uh, hooked me again. We st- stood like one 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 weekend first, and then uh, more weekends and so forth until actually I, we we got the the task needed for other protocols. And then after a while, uh, he he convinced me to to move full full time into Web three. We also had a, a, a fund. Uh, back then, uh, where we actually uh, ended up investing in Cosmos uh, as well, I think in the private, in Polkadot, uh, Zilliqa, pretty much everything what was infrastructure uh, uh, back then, we were one of the first backers. And um, uh, yeah, w- while researching pretty much all those new protocols uh, and working with them, bringing, trying to contribute to, to their ecosystem, actually, we learned a lot of the stuff. And uh, that was maybe the the also one of the triggers where um, back back in the days we 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 look at the the performance cap- or capabilities of the the throughput of all those protocols that were coming up from 2016 2017 and so forth and we 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 just had the thought experiment okay well, if we're gonna put like one eight billion people into any of these kind of architectures would would it stand. Would it still stay alive? Would it still have we still reach consensus or, or uh, have any kind of uh, meaningful performance such that it will it could gain, uh, gain uh, world adoption? And uh, basically, we we kind of reached the conclusion that uh, the state problem or the, the 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 state size of any of those blockchains will will become pretty much the 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 main killer of and killer not uh, as we use in web3 the good part of uh, killer actually <laughs> literally uh, will, will kill any kind of performance that could those architecture reach and maybe 
uh, well, the funny thing is that we, we, our intuition was, okay, so some sort of parallelization should happen with the, like those kind of sharding and proof of stake was intuitively the next, uh, the, 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 the design that we should approach. And we went actually to several of those, those uh, ecosystem projects that were already working on, on very complex uh, problems and uh, p- uh, pitched them that they should do sharding. And everybody said, no, it's not doable. So it's uh, funny enough that everybody said, no, you cannot do that. It's too hard, too complicated. Why would you do that? Uh, and here we are, I think, uh, after six years, seven years with everything live and Ethereum still, uh, I think, uh, uh, arguing that some of the stuff are literally hardcore. I, 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 I cannot uh, uh, not, not agree with that. There were many, many sleepless nights and uh, <laughs> many attempts. To, to build this kind of stuff. But yeah, I think this is very briefly how, how uh, also the background and also how we got to to uh, at least have the, the thoughts uh, in the direction of Elrond architecture, initial architecture. Yeah, that that's super interesting. I think, yeah, I guess there was a phase where the Ethereum scaling roadmap was also sharding based and then it sort of shifted back to like this roll-up architecture now and we... We're basically still there, right? And I think in the wider space, like some people are, people, depends on which pocket you are in, you maybe even forgot about charting that it like existed. But then on the other hand, we have like projects like like you and maybe I guess the other mention of one is near that has uh, implemented charting actually. So uh, yeah, super curious to hear from you more about like how how that actually works and how you how you set it up to. Uh, and yeah, basically the problems that it solves. So maybe we can we can dive a little bit deeper in there, like how you actually do the sharding. So maybe we start just from like sort of the the validator set that you have and how how they are sort of set up. More than happy, more than happy. So maybe just so, some some context. Um, we f- funny enough that you 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 mentioned uh, you you mentioned the the sharding part or the the sharding from from Ethereum roadmap. We actually worked with Prismatic Labs in 2017 on the Ethereum sharding model. So uh, it, we, we I, I just had a, a discussion uh, on the I think last conferences with with explaining again how the architecture of Multiverse X or Elrond looked like all in the production. It was very 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 similar to what Ethereum 2.0 uh, looked like, especially at least the the st- uh, the, the staking part uh, with Q with all those modules. Actually, uh, Elrond and Multiverse Six had, had, had uh, both of them actually brought to the production. But also uh, another funny part, I would say, uh, Sunny was, uh, I guess, one of the first guys that did the peer review of the paper in 2017. And then also Vasily from Lido uh, has been grilling me uh, about the randomness source uh, of the chain in 2016, 17, I think or 18, something like that, around that, uh, a lot, and eventually contributed to the architecture as well. So very, very, very nice, actually, to see that all, all those uh, builders have contributed and always contribute. This. If there's something that builders have in common, they all contribute to the best things. Now, going back to the architecture model uh, of uh, Multiverse X and going a bit into the technical stuff, the, the, I would say the, the, the first step would be to... Um, uh, walk walk the thought process that I, I look at as uh, at any blockchain architecture pretty much. So if we take for example Ethereum as a supercomputer, a supercomputer is still a computer in the end, and it has three major components. So you have kind of CPU, RAM, disk, where CPU is consensus. You throw a lot of requests at him. Uh, uh, it works with a very fast mem- with a very fast memory, which is the RAM, where you basically iterate very or permutate those values once you reach consensus, and you write to the disk how you got there. Right. So this is like a I would say blockchain 101 explained in 30 seconds. Uh, and also as a supercomputer, put this and distribu- just distributed over the internet and then that's kind of it. But the next point would be, if we look at general compute architecture, how we scaled up the system, we did not end up with a CPU with a single thread that has 100 gigahertz, but rather we have a bunch of threads that parallelize the execution. They all Also, all of those threads work with a, a, a very fast memory, which is the RAM, where you have, even though you have physically the RAM, uh, as one one piece, actually each of the threads are having a pre-allocated subset of memory right, which is uh, like each of the threads in order to work, in order to be able to process it, it uh, actually reserves a, a set of memory of the RAM. And then, of course, once they reach uh, the or um, 
solve the data the request it writes to the disk how we got there now that this is like the general compute this is also if we look at uh around on multiverse x how it looks like or, or how it, it works actually you have the beacon chain similar to ethereum 2.0 and then you have a bunch of execution shards if you remember the the initial ethereum sharding architecture it it has it it basically uh, push out the state per the state to the execution shards where the state transition will be maintained on the execution shards. So basically you have the, this kind of beacon chain which is notarizing all those uh, uh, blocks pro being produced on the, the, the sub, sub shards or the execution shards level uh, while basically that that allows uh, uh, and goes us basically to, to the entire sharding model. Maybe before going even more into uh, specific and losing pretty much maybe a b bunch of the guys uh, uh, what, what is being notarized, what headers and so forth. I would just do a, a, a step back, maybe defining a bit the the problem of the sharding. Right? Um, I would say uh, one of the points here. That, so like there are three kinds of sharding. So there there is uh, I, I would say uh, transaction sharding where we have uh, had, had architecture similar to Zilliqa. Zilliqa, for example, was one of the first one. Pro, uh, uh, that that proposed that kind of uh, model, which allowed any kind of state transition or kind of move balance uh, parallelization in within the same chain, in within the same binary, right? So that's cool. However, as soon the the, the chain has hit one uh, one transaction or one smart contract uh, transaction, for example, which would have iterate multiple accounts, they, there would have been a memory lock on the entire state, and that would would not allow any kind of parallelization at this point. So the next point would be um there's like the network sharding like if we look and for example uh this the way the architecture is being built on our case you we have uh, the we have a, a total of 300 to 3200 validator seats and all those seats are be, being allocated into four chunks or four sub shards one, uh, each of them maintaining 800 in this case like beacon chain has 800 validators shard zero has 800 shard one or do each each 800 basically at the, the network topology level there's uh on top of of leap peer-to-peer -peer, an authentication layer where it tells like once you go and again this might be a bit uh technical for for people basically once you go into and and uh you connect to the leap peer to peer network you you need to have some some sort of uh, an id like a public private key infrastructure now on top of that what you can do actually you can sign the messages with the private key of the validator which will tell the other counterparty which is receiving the message if uh, you are, uh, you are, uh, what kind of peer are you? So are you coming from the same shard? Are you coming from a different shard? And basically there's a, a specific optimizer set, which will tell each of the validators, Hey, I, I have a maximum, for example, like, uh, again, just defining the problem, like network traffic is perhaps the most ex uh, expensive resource we have in the internet right now. And that's one one of the, the problems also that we need to optimize. So you, assuming that you can have in into a parallelization system where where uh, um, each of the validators maintains only a subset of the network, you also need to pass a lot of those messages and and kind of kind of find the optimum route to connect those peers to each other. Now, because of this kind of, of first, you 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 have uh, as I said, the first the 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 authentication method or the signing method with the, the validator key on top of each of the messages, then on the other side, assuming that I'm synchronized and uh, I'm synchronized with, the, with the, the, the network, I can tell the public key that has signed this message uh, where it comes from on based on my knowledge of the network configuration, uh, I can tell, okay, this public key should be actually validating or should be a, a validator in shard two or in the meta chain and I can assign this public key or, or this this network connection to to a routing protocol where, where I keep a, a certain amount of connections uh, optimal or, or for an optimal uh, broadcasting message or propagation protocol in order to 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 reach and always have highly com highly available high, or high connectivity and low low latency between validators intra shard. And still maintain some sort of a cross-chain connectivity for uh, with, with all other shards, such that they will never become a lonely lonely island. So there, there's 
I, I hope, let, let me, like, let's break here and maybe I'll let you ask some questions. I know there's a, a lot of stuff, uh, like there, there's very specific layers, but uh, more than that, to explain everything. No, sounds great. Uh, that's super, super interesting. So basically, first of all, maybe one question, the meta chain, which is like kind of the beacon chain, I guess, in your system, it's not that every validator actually validates this as well. So, but rather it's also like just a normal shard in some sense. No, no. So, so basically there's first, uh, there, there's shared security model. So basically the entire pool uh, of 3,200 validator seats are randomly allocated around uh, uh, among all the shards. So there's no no special pref uh, configuration, no special preferences for the beacon chain. You just basically get uh, every epoch shuffled and being allocated to to that shard. The only difference is um, like in the current configuration is that the the consensus size or the consensus yeah the consensus participation for every round is 400 or 400. Like there, I, I, I could just. Maybe just define a, a couple more stuff. <laughs> let's, let's, let's do right. So uh, basically, there's uh, let, if we go on the the chronology part first, right? So let's define what's what's the metric of accounting uh, or or uh, measuring inside the blockchain. So we have epochs which are equal to 24 hours, and then there's rounds. Uh, current round time is equal to six seconds, uh, which will get improved with the next protocol updates to I think three, two seconds, one second and hopefully sub-second finality before the end of the year. Maybe, uh, now that's uh, chronology, then there's validators uh, which have two different states uh, or had two different states, so there's active and waiting. The reason for that is basically um, each epoch, 400 validators are being elected or uh, elected to, to validate each of the, the shards, including beacon chain. Where eight uh, the other uh, uh, so four hundred are being elected and uh, the other four hundred are in the waiting state. Be why? Because there is every epoch, every epoch the the the, uh, the validators are uh, a third of the validators are being random sep sampled to reshuffle uh, across validate uh, across the shards such that they will never be able to collude to take over a shard. So by doing that, basically. We also have a built-in protocol time for those validators to synchronize the new state. So, assuming, for example, that I'm I'm being relocated to a new shard, then I have a built-in in the protocol a a, a guaranteed time frame for my node. Even if I will just like in practice, the node will destroy and delete the the, the entire database. Will just go and and synchronize the 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 snapshot the the three snapshots for from the the current epoch and then build on top of that the current state of the chain assuming that at the net, net next epoch change i am eligible to become validated right so maybe that's very raw a bit what how how the the consensus consensus or chronology works and then also a bit tied to to the to the to the shuffling part Right. Yeah, that's super interesting. And this syncing, like how long does it actually take right now? Or because I guess you need to be able to do it in 24 hours, but it... So so there are two parts. Uh, there's basically, uh, for, first, there's uh, uh, three snapshots. So we're we, like three pruning. We implemented the three pruning, which allows us actually at each of the epoch change to clean up the, the old, old uh, or on the old state. You Like the tree will always maintain only the 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 latest and greatest so to say version of the leaves or, or, or the tree tree model which will be uh actually transferred in the new snapshot where basically uh that gets to also to to the next problem to the the state charting uh because uh may, maybe defy like right right now it, it takes uh, just to answer your question it takes i think around uh, maybe hour two hours and that could be optimized and we have optimized a lot and so forth However, this this is like the general the general problem. What what we are doing, and now so we we kind of touch on the network sharding. We kind of touch about the design and rationale. Why you need like putting network sharding on top of this kind of architecture? You kind of see all this kind of engineering breakthroughs on top of all those uh, primitives to to highly optimize the throughput of the network and the latency. However, the main problem, I think, what we, we, we were solving is the state problem. And like, if you take the, 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 the state 
or if you take like put put uh, the world population of eight billion people into uh, a just a database and try to iterate and do hundreds of thousands of transactions or thousands of transactions per second while finding those accounts like you need to iterate on eight billion uh, uh, entries inside that database find those entries uh, and uh, change the values and then redo the search for the next one and so forth so that could not scale and also in the in the same time try to replicate this database uh, uh as many times across the call like if like if we take the blockchain trilemma from Vitalik, uh, I think that's the most famous one that everybody knows. You you, you cannot, like the problem says, that you cannot achieve um, uh, scalability, security, and decentralization without compromising any of those uh, without sharding. Like sharding is the, the, what was the design for, for that. And actually what it does, um, if, for example, uh, if we take the Ethereum uh, address range as an example, and you would take um, 0x000001 as a beginning, and then you have 0, 10 at the end uh, as an end, and you would split into a sharded model. Those Each, each of the shards will persist only a subset of those accounts, right? So in practice, um, the storage, like the, the every everything related to those accounts will be pre-allocated uh, or allocated to a specific shard, and that specific shard will, will, will maintain the storage of it. While now, if we take and do the uh, step back at the consensus or, or the, the entire architecture model, basically you can, if for example, a transaction would be intra shard, like assuming that the first zero to five are in the same shard and the, the next five to 10 are in the next shard, uh, basically each of the shards could process in parallel. They will run consensus every block, every block, every, every block. And then basically when the transaction is intra shard in, 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 inside the same storage, it will happen atomically. And then when not, then it will just reach out over the beacon chain through the notarization method. And that's, I think, the next uh, uh, point where we're, we're going to dive into. But I'm, I'm pausing here again, uh, letting you maybe to ask some questions if it's clear enough, if it is. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you still always go through the main to the beacon chain ask for like interop shard interoperability and i guess does it work i remember from like near actually that you know if like some transaction is actually on the same shard they still kind of wait this one epoch and delay it so there's no benefit of being on the same shard somehow is that like something you guys do as yeah, well or? yeah so so there there are two 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 problems here what so the first is um, the composability problem? I guess that's the most the most uh, interesting. Uh, the, the the most re I think the only reason why Ethereum have not implemented sharding yet, right? So why, why like assuming that you run consensus on each of the shards, and for, for example, there are two shards and the beacon chain. Every time your a transaction needs to like it is assuming that I'm I, I have the the account with ID like with the ending one and then I'm calling a, shard, a, a a a smart contract which has the it is in the same shard and basically everything happens atomically uh, in the same in the same transaction I can just compose and so forth. However, if for example the 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 account that I'm trying to 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 go to is uh, uh, it, it outside my postal code just to quote the 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 near uh, the near podcast as well. Basically, uh, I, I need to go through the router, right? And the router will 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 kind of ensure me the guarantee of the message delivery. However, it will not happen uh, at the same same uh, in the same block. Uh, but here there are two 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 pro two problems. I would say first, there's the throughput problem. Like you could still try to concentrate everything into a single blockchain. However, there are some sort of uh, uh, improvements that could be done in order uh, or like engineering engineering steps that could reach to comp atomic atomic composability across multiple shards but the the, the main the main the, the most interesting part I, I would say that's the easy part almost I would say once you have a sharded blockchain it's easy it's easy to go easier to go back and compromise again I would almost compromise again and then kind of reach consensus across all the shards where, whereby the, the most crazy part is that nobody solved until now or at, before I run the full state sharded problem. Like the, the, the cool part is, for example, now 
let me let me break it down to to something that uh, I, I think is also very 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 known for everybody. Like the the uh, travel agency problem, where I think it was described in an Ethereum forums back then. You where you want, for example, I'm 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 a, a uh, uh, an end user and I go to a travel agency and I want to, regardless where the accounts are being distributed inside this architecture, I want with the same ticket, I like, I want in my, my offer, if I want, I buy this, this holiday ticket to get a train ticket, hotel, uh, a car rental and, and a, a plane. Yeah. And if, if, uh, if I buy into the smart contract, the results should contain all of them or nothing. Now, this is the cool part. Like, uh, nobody says that everything in, even in computer science problems, not, not, not everything happens synchronously. Not, like, even, even the, the, the way we communicate right now is not synchronously. It has an asynchronous model which guarantees the, 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 the tra uh, transport of the messages. And then we built on top of those transfer messages a bunch of algorithms or a bunch of software which can handle this kind of... Uh, the modular approach. And now if we look like um, the, the way we approach, like what multiverse or Elrod or sharding promises is it guarantees a way of forwarding messages from A to B, but with some, some specific properties. Like for example, uh, if we know that the message will, will take uh, a, a, a while, you can basically go and lock that memory. You can define the interfaces, so to say, on top of that, to work and 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 specifically say, hey, I want for this ticket for the smart contract that is going to purchase everything. I want them to await and store this kind of information and asynchronously, like when I'm calling this contract, the contract will send a receipt or will send ten other transactions that might take even two seconds, five seconds, or two blocks, three blocks, whatever. And whenever they will reach their destination. I, I'm awaiting a message back and I know the protocol guarantees a message back to me and it will tell me what to do, if it is successful or not, right? So this is like the, the beauty of asynchronous execution that you can build prim primitives or on top of those primitives and can build on top of this messaging layer where you can asynchronous call and have composability uh, for and also not compromising on the, the throughput of the network, right? So... This is kind of, kind of, uh, kind of it. And maybe the, the, the even crazier part is knowing, for example, the, the, the part with the network, network sharding that I've been mentioning before. And also that the network itself is kind of synchronized, uh, synchronized over, over all this kind of primitives, cryptographic primitives and, and, uh, con consensus state. Basically, you could, if I know that, for example, in advance, uh, like one of the, the looking uh, maybe few few seconds into the future, <laughs> how, how, how could the, uh, such a protocol still achieve ev what, what every, everybody else has, but what the other ones w could never achieve sharding just like that? Basically, if I know which transaction or what transaction uh, uh, I need to talk or execute synchronously, and I know that the destination of it, basically I could easily target those validator sets or the protocol could talk to those validator sets and make them achieve consensus for all, for all, uh, for automicity for one specific upcoming round where they will execute one one specific transaction from a to z across all the the the, the accounts inside the, the chain right but in the same time you can still have you can still persist this kind of asynchronous model for everything else where you don't need to guarantee everything uh, in the same in the same block, like the the same way the internet doesn't guarantee us uh, oh, oh, <laughs> that everything uh, just comes and drops everything and just process one one single thread at a time. I, I hope it makes sense. I I, I think it's uh... yeah yeah yeah. I I think it makes sense. So you're saying that you can like so there is a way to guarantee this somehow, and then basically in that specific scenario, more or less the shards act like. A single shard for this string of transactions exactly, or whatever exactly. it is. But also while not uniting the state. So the consent, you can, I can still work in like the same way if the model works in an asynchronous model already. Basically, we will just speed up the message passing from one, one to another and we will still 
do consensus on that kind of messaging. But instead of doing it asynchronously, if there's enough economic incentives, for example, for, for that kind of processing, it can be prioritized, scheduled, and then reached and executed in, into one single transaction. That could be a swap. I, I mean, uh, it's just an engineering, pure engineering problem. It's not uh, something that cannot be solved. Like if we have solved all and built all this kind of stuff, then I, I do believe that that's uh, just a... Uh, <laughs> A couple of uh, sleepless nights, I would say. <laughs> Just in a few, it took a few years. Um, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So, but right now, do you can you do this prioritization, or is it like? I guess it leads a bit into you know what are like the prioritized transactions in general in blockchain is like sort of MEV related, like arbitrage or whatnot across. Like, is this something you can already do on on Multiverse X? It, I think it's clear a bit how the, the logic of the, the sharding. Then on top of that, what we're uh, building, maybe uh, it, it would be um, there, each of the shards, by the way, has uh, its own VM. So it has its own uh, execution environment and so forth. And on top of that, basically, we, we built at the, uh, 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 sub, some primitives, which is called uh, um, time lock and promises. Like you can define at the interface of each of the spa contracts what kind of what kind of properties do you want? Like defining you want TCP or UDP? Do you want, for example, uh, do you, do you want that uh, if like when I'm shooting to this smart contract and this smart contract calls another ten smart contracts, do I need? Does the user wants whatever it, it gets, or do what do you want to await all all the all the results? of uh, all, all the smart contracts. And if that passes, basically, I'm, I'm just confirming, sealing the, 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 the result, or I'm, I'm, I can go back to those contracts and say, hey, I don't want them, right? So you can define all those kind of specific properties on, on each of the interfaces, how you want to do that. What we don't have is the synchronous consensus among all the shards. Uh, where where I, I can do that. We don't have right now because it was not a problem. The, 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 it would be, it is kind of a challenge for us uh, because we, we only had blockchains that are single-threaded. <laughs> Let me put it this way. We don't even have the mindset to think about applications that are multi-threaded. Like, you do, what, what, if, what if I can design such, 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 such applications that can instead of having just one single thread, one single smart contracts, for example, for wrapping or unwrapping tokens or whatever else you're thinking, where you can actually have this kind of primitives available in all sub shards. And then I think that's kind of the challenge of also of Ethereum with rollups that you only have some, some primitives available at one specific layer, and then you need to broadcast them, reproduce them to all other layers. Um, I also have some, some interesting uh, uh, notes on, on that end, actually. But um, yeah, uh, I, I hope it answers uh, your question to, to that end. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that makes sense. And I guess, yeah, you mentioned also like every shard has their own VM. Um, is it all like the same VM basically. So, yeah. so we we have three kinds of. Uh, uh, so first, on top of the blockchain, we well, on top of the blockchain accounts, we kind of built a, a routing system where you ha can have multiple VMs. The cool part it is you ended the data field. For example, when you're calling a smart contract, uh, a smart contract, you can define. There's a kind of a switch where you can say, hey, I want this transaction to be originated, or the account that I'm talking to, I want them to to uh, call the bytecode with a specific VM. So I can tell through this kind of switch uh, what, what kind of VM I want to. I don't, I, it's a storage at the end of the day. If, if we decouple the, the execution from the storage, then basically I can just tell, hey, go to that specific uh, storage, take, take that bytecode and map it into a specific VM. In our case, we have a Wasm VM. We built on top of a Wasmer. It's called a space VM. And then there's all a framework on top of that, which abstracts the entire complexity of sharding, which is called Spacecraft uh, SDK, right? So uh, the, the, <laughs> the cool part is basically what, what, what um, that's one, one of the frameworks, like this is the most used for, 
for anything smart contract related. And then also on top of that, we also have a, a Go, Go or like a system VM where we used, uh, for example, for staking primitives, like system specific applications or logic where you need high, very, very efficient computation and very fast. Uh, yeah, you, 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 that's kind of what, what, uh, what, why we, the reason why we do that. The, the funny part is actually because of the, the new SDK, like the sovereign chains, I think we're going to touch on that as, as well, is we're incentivizing people. And because of the entire modularity that we, we build on top, you can, we're actually putting grants for people that w w would uh, take and build port different VMs for, to, to the ecosystem. So, for example, there's uh, one of the projects that I'm very really excited about that does Ethereum, EVM compatibility. So, imagine that you basically, in the future, the main chain could, uh, with, in, in one transaction, with a, you, you're calling one, one specific smart contract, and then that specific contract, you could take the output and inject it into the next VM. That is, for example, you take a WASM bytecode, you're calling a WASM bytecode, and then you call a Solidity code, and then you take it with that result, you, you have you reach composability across multiple VM, more VM, Solana VM, and so forth, right? So uh, that's kind of the end goal, the, the, the direction for the VM execution side. And then on the, the sharding part, uh, there's uh, a lot of consensus uh, optimization. There's a lot of, uh, like, uh, even block time is, I think, from my point of view, a bit too slow. Uh, it, but what, five, six years ago, it was reasonable, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, always something to do. Okay, super interesting. I guess, yeah, especially like um, heading into the sovereign chains realm, I guess we have seen more and more this like application specific paradigm, I guess, play out, right? Like, I think that's like where it started in Cosmos and sort of like everyone built their own chain, everything is a chain, your fridge is a chain. And um, I guess Cosmos has this approach, okay, you have the sovereign chains or like the app chains and then IBC. Uh, in your case, that's like sort of the, the sharding, but now you're also bringing in, as I understand, like sort of a model to have your own chain within this system. Like how, how does it work? Is it also like, is it an additional shard? Is it just something that lives on a shard or yeah, how... Can you Definitely. E explain a bit more what sovereign chains M are. More, yeah. more than that. So maybe f first... Uh, I, I would just define the, the problem. Like we've been very good on running multiple binaries, so like multiple chains in parallel, architecture, uh, orchestrating them into an, uh, an invisible layer, would say with through the orchestrating them through the beacon chain, such that you don't care where the accounts would, would leave actually in, in, your, in, in your entire architecture. And then by doing that, actually, we kind of learned and said, hey, uh, we, we kind of, we're kind of good on running this kind of specialized chains or, or almost paralyzed chains. Why don't we just repack, uh, rebuild the the, uh, the the code base such that it will turn into an SDK, which actually could if like if you have if you look at the internet architecture, you don't have just public cloud where you are sharing the resources with everybody else. You could what if you could just deploy your own private cloud but still maintain all your own sovereignty. Like the cool part is is like. First, you get all the primitives, everything that we build with Elrond on Multiverse 6 for the last couple of years uh, out of the box, but also pretty modular when it comes to, uh, you can define your own consensus size. You can run your own consensus. You can, for example, decide at which point in time you want to post the transaction to another chain. Like you're not tied to Multiverse X. You, you can basically decide, hey, I want to, um, uh, run the consensus of 400 or 400, for example, validators. I want to have POS, I want to have a block time of four or block, block, block time of one second. And I want every time there's an interaction, I can write in into the Go binary. I can say every time there's an interaction to with a specific address, you need to go and do, post this transaction to Ethereum or whatever. You can just compose this kind of new features on, on, on top of that. So that's kind of the, the narrative. I do believe like, yeah, People, uh, I think Sunny again was saying yeah, you're kind of cost copying the cosmos stuff, <laughs> but uh, I mean that's the beauty of it. I think from where it came from, uh, people say uh, if you if you're being copied, you're it, it means that you you were doing right, right? So definitely, I think uh, cosmos and IBC and so forth was was the the part where I, I learned mo most of the stuff uh, uh, pre prior to to starting what I'm doing now. Uh, now, I think we defined a bit what, what the capabilities of the SDK. The narrative it is with it that um, it should go and serve 
other ecosystem better than what, what the main chain was designed to. And also with that, we're actually providing grants and supporting uh, all this kind of new teams that are building this, uh, like Popolka that has that had this concept of pallets, for example, where you can just build new new modules that you can attach and compose. Like I think even Cosmwasm is a very, very good example that one team built something and then it, it got implemented to pretty much and uh, provided a smart contract execution environment to all other platforms, right? I think first it pro like besides the privacy or the the sovereignty of your own uh application needs you you're kind of you're also uh, fueling a lot more innovation at the entire ecosystem level to connect and also bridge uh kind of have a, a bridge bridging method to solana to cosmos to uh ethereum and so forth but not only on the virtual like on the messaging part but also you where you can uh, get and deploy the applications from there that have been built there into this kind of new newer uh, newer uh, setting, right? So this is kind of an approach. There are three three like I, I do believe like one one is the application specific logic. Of course, that's the best one. DYDX again is I think I, I love the, the podcast with the DYDX by the way uh, here, <laughs> and uh, that's I think the best explanation of what an app, app a specific logic would look like. Then there's the consumer grade from my point of view, where you have this kind of uh, gelato uh, alt layer and all this kind of other application where you have consumer grade uh, tons of blockchains that will be deployed. And then uh, there's enterprises. And that, that that would be, I think, another podcast to touch on what enterprises use cases uh, would allow. But now, going again to some, something more technical, imagine, imagine that right now, there's Ethereum as a beacon chain, as a meta chain uh, compared to Multiverse X. And then you have a bunch of shards, which are L2s, rollups, with sequencers that are posting this kind of uh, transactions to the main chain. The cool part is like the, the most easier way to understand would be like, I always, like, I, I always envision that Ethereum would eventually define a standard where all those headers or blocks that are, or data that is being pushed into the blobs into the ethereum beacon chain will kind of get synchronized across the l2s so i think like in 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 our case assuming that for example you you have four four chip four four shards one is beacon chain and three execution shards and they all produce block 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 one after another now if the 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 shards for example the shard header blocks would be pushed to meta chain and the meta chain will notarize those headers and the next block actually will be again fetched by the execution shards uh, from what it will it will tell them each of them what's the height or or the finality on each of the sources of the messages. Now the cool part is you kind of build a, a some sort of a trustless invisible finality model across synchron synchronized across all the L twos. If you would apply the same Elrond or Multiverse X uh, model to Ethereum uh, ca case, to the Ethereum case, the only problem is, I, I like I hoped that that will will be the end game, or at least if they drop sharding, that could work as it, with minimal minimal uh, changes. However, the, the the problem is the longer the wait and the many the more the chains go and post the data to another uh, beacon chain, right? then you, you cannot synchronize them anymore. Like you, I cannot know, assuming that, for example, you're, you're a roll-up, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're a roll-up, I'm a roll-up, and we're both posting the data to the beacon chain and we're fetching the next block from Ethereum, we can both know, I can know from the block from Ethereum if your data was included without talking to you, right? So in this case, this is exactly how MetaChain works for the uh, Ethereum, for, for LROP for Multiverse 6 model. But uh, assuming that we're all going to talk to that specific beacon chain. Now, the, the, the next problem would be, and now this is, comes again to the, to the sovereign chain, assuming that we're going to have 10,000 10, uh, uh, shards or 10,000 rollups in the space. Now, where would this data be processed, pushed to, so even, even if it comes only to a block header? Uh, to a minimum kind of information, you still have this kind of overhead of communication that you need to do and integrate and write this kind of minimum information into an authorization chain that will give us the synchronicity or the, the synch synchronicity across 
execution in, in order to execute stuff directly from one to another and not routing them, routing the, the data per, per se to through the beacon chain. Now that's uh, the, and that's the, the reasoning. Like we we I've thought okay what if I, I, I we are Ethereum right? So you, assuming that we will be we will get to the same problem. It's just a matter of time where, where each of the blockchains will just get to the same problems. That the uh, then what what would what what would happen? And in this case, for example, if you would apply the same principle as Ethereum, that means in order uh, to to my transaction to get forwarded to your chain, I need to compete economically speaking to with all other L twos that my transaction will fit into that block space, very limited block space of one beacon chain. Now, if the, for example, if the shards are being connected to the execution shards and there's a, a proper messaging system through the execution shards, the execution shards will have tons of capacity to broadcast, to, to, to process uh, tens of thousands of shards. So it's just the scale of things is just, just put it at the, uh, at the, the power of 10, right? And then you'll, you'll get kind of the problems where, where everything will, will just uh, kind of hit, hit the limitation. I, will, I hope it, it's not too abstract and it just goes a bit to the design rationales. Yeah, yeah, no, I think, I think it makes sense. I, is it then, I guess it's also a problem, especially since we have like sort of this L3 thing now as well, where someone posts then first to like uh, the L2 and then I guess, yeah, you have like another tree that basically that is not synchronized with the beacon chain and, and that might be it. 100%, exactly that, that's the, the main problem. Like it would require that like L2 to post the transaction or the state of that L2 to that, that receipt or the, the, the state of that L3 to L2 and then from L2 to N while L1 in order to that message to get through. Like that, that, that won't work. And, and assuming that, as I said, that the, the L1 will still be the same, like uh, we, I think we do have a lot of uh, data availability models and other stuff that, that kind of, again, fragments the state. If, if we assume that the, the model will be default as a sequencer, where only, only someone will keep the state, and uh, in order to execute or trust anything, you, you'll need to kind of fetch, fetch that state. Uh, uh, that, that, I think that kind of... Uh, uh, in, Add some 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 sort of uh, challenges, like uh, again some some sort of challenges. How would you talk to each other? We, like then we'll we'll fall back again to bridges. Or I think IBC is the the good the, the good. Uh, I think I hope I, I hope like take, thanks God IBC exists. They, they might save save the entire uh, messaging fragmentation uh, across the all of those layers. <laughs> right, 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 right. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we went like. Pretty deep here. I think we hopefully we didn't like lose everyone along the way, but uh, I think yeah, super interesting to hear this from yeah, like your experience, how you went through and how far everything has come. So maybe we can uh, for the last few minutes uh, switch a bit to you know like the broader multiverse X story. I guess you you're not just building this tech. I mean, I guess you predominantly uh, are like deep in that, but. Uh, there's obviously like stuff being built on top of it. And I think what's interesting in your case is, yeah, that is like a very integrated ecosystem with like many, many parts sort of handled in some way by, by, uh, by your team or like sort of the, the, the broader Multiverse X ecosystem itself versus like, you know, some more fragmented thing uh, that is like sort of Ethereum, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I guess maybe the question is, you know, how do you think about this like ecosystem building and, uh, integrating things or, or what's like the broader vision there? I think, uh, it seems like also sovereign chains are trying to bring a little bit more other people more in. So yeah, happy to hear how you're, how you're thinking about that and the future for, for like the sort of multiverse X ecosystem. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, so, uh. The, 100% agree with the part that we're trying to get even more ambitious people involved, but also the smart contract framework. Uh, it kind of proven at least to some sort of the uh, 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 threshold that it it can work. So the dimension the, the has pretty much all kind of primitives from uh, concentrated liquidity, stable swaps, uh, uh, all kind of uh, AMM pools, uh, liquid staking, multiple liquid staking protocols. Uh, and all that so that that's that but now going even to the deeper level if you want to like if you want to 
persist and build a, 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 a protocol that will be developed for a decade to come, you cannot train people only at the smart contract level and then assume that they will contribute to the protocol, right? So this is kind of a two, two-sided two sword. Uh, I, I really hope that it will, will, will work. But maybe going back to, uh, to your question, uh, yeah, we, we, we kind of built uh, many teams, like uh, now they're getting more like a spin off their own space. But one of the, the pro- products is uh, Exportal, one of the spin offs from, from Multiverse X, where um, what we're very interesting is uh, our approach was again, I, I think everybody remembers build the platform and developers will follow, build pre developers, user will follow. Like that, that's kind of a, a lie, but we, we heard through, through many cycles and then we, we kind of got, we believed that uh, uh, naively enough, build the protocol and then uh, waited for the users, right? And the users almost never came. And then while, while doing that, we, we could wait it, wait it, and, uh, waited to, to, for some results or said, okay, we're kind of high, hardcore engineers, let's try to do something about it. And that's how we actually um, uh, start the, the next year in the end. And the, the, when with one hand, we were kind of having this bottom-up approach with the protocol and sharding, scaling for masses. But then if you want to, uh, to, to scale and reach mass adoption, then looking at the internet, there were like two, two, two moments. Like there was the fiber channel where you have distribution, like what the sharding does, and then you need, we had the internet browser moment where you kind of have extracted the, the entire complexity when not only the geeks could work and, and start using internet, you kind of have the, the, the browser moment. And that's actually what we tried to do with the X portal, where the portal would be the portal, your portal to everything. So it kind of abstracts the entire complexity. We built that kind of uh, that, that product as well, which I think, I think 1.5 million users in less, the first 12, I think 12 or 24 months after the launch. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, that allowed us to to build uh, uh, or at least experiment some some very interesting stuff, like two on chain two FA, right? So I can give you a, a very short like wh- wh- where we come from. Like we're the second unicorn of the country, and then what? There there were a lot of people that put bets on us and believed in us and so forth. And we we did not st- t- or we think that we 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 did not go went against other communities and so forth and built our own community base, but. Whenever people trust you and they put bets on you, they're taking a lot of risk. And what happened actually when you onboard 1 million users with zero experience in crypto, the hackers were in heaven. Like you could imagine how much social engineering against those users happened and how many people uh, kind of also lost money uh, into all this kind of uh, 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 phishing attempts and all that kind of stuff. So we thought... What, what what can it, what can be done such that, that the next bull run will will I can sleep good and know that even my parents are safe, right? <laughs> so what we did actually, I said, uh, hmm, okay, if we do like the the uh, 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 external old accounts like EOA accounts approach, that would mean that every transaction would need to go to the a VM execution, right? So it will need a smart contract to open, verify the signatures, and you basically, especially in the Wasm environment, there's still a lot of work to do. Like it could get even better, and we do. You don't want to add in a chain of, let's say, you were you call ten smart contracts for liquidating a AMM or whatever. Just add another multi sig on top or ten multi sigs on top, and with cryptographic primitives, it will just get worse. So we said, today's today. Let's see what what can be done. So we we actually uh, added a secondary field at the protocol level, which is checks a guardian, so called guardian signature, which is basically the the X portal comes with a black box signature, uh, a black black box. Uh, uh, memoric, which you cannot read well, only through encrypted backup, such that it is, is foolproof. And then you basically, in that way, you register the application uh, or the device at the protocol level to co-sign your transaction. So you basically uh, cannot, even if I give you right now the memonic of one Multiverse X account, there was a page like called uh, Eagled Heist where there were like 6 million people trying to uh, w- watch uh, or saw that, that post with a, a seed phrase published where they could, could not steal the money. Be, why? Because it requires the same way you, even if you have the my, my bank account login, you require the 2FA, the second signature, right? The second device that will authenticate you. And we, we kind of took the same principles as a bank account, uh, like uh, no, uh, as a staking account. You, uh, like assuming that I, I have a phone, 
uh, uh, here I, I, I have registered and I have the second one where I am importing just the, the seed phrase and try to, to initiate this kind of transaction. And then the first thing, okay, I will notice I cannot move the, the, the funds because they're locked. I, uh, let's, let me try to re-register a new, a new, the same way you would call the bank and say, hey, I want to, I just want a new token. Fuck it. I, I lost that, that one, <laughs> drop it. I, I, I need a new one. They say, okay, sure, I, I'll mail you one. Right, so they they will first give you some sort of a time a buffer that no not this you, you you it's not the gun held to your head to while while you're doing that call it's it's kind of kind of common sense and then the the process would be uh, I, I I try to register I would send the transaction on chain that goes through I'm allowed to do that but the transaction has a bonding time of twenty days. Right, so in that case the second device which is already assuming that I still have my uh, assuming that I still have access to my credit device, it will have a notification similar to, for example, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Is it you that you're trying to log in? Yes or no? If I say yes, basically I, it, it asks me, do you want to give the rights to those this new device to sign, to move the balance or whatever, give the rights to sign the transaction? Yes or no? If I say no, then basically it's just, the, the, that account can just retry to re-register. But it, it cannot move any funds. The cool part, if I can say yes, then instantly it just goes and transfers the security. Now, those are like, on the one hand, just going back, on the one hand, you have this kind of super fast infrastructure, crazy, complex. And then on the other hand, you, you just go to foolproof versions of applications where I, I know that my, my, my parents are safe on the internet and they can uh, do this kind of transaction. Maybe then. Yeah, the, the one, one of the very interesting parts is we also acquired, I think we're kind of the, the only L1s coming out from Europe where we acquired uh, and have an e-money license and a, a kind of neo bank license to operate IBAN accounts and have issued in partnership with MasterCard a debit card attached to IBAN accounts that in, now packing it into with the protocol one, with the L, L1, packing it with a, a very cool uh, user interface, you could basically... Um, uh, just easily uh, spend and use all this kind of super hardcore tech and cool stuff that goes decentralized and open border and so forth, but also at the same time, just go go outside and buy your beer, right? So uh, what what if? Uh, our, our, our question was, what if we can do that? And uh, actually, it, it, it ended up that we, we actually were alive with uh, all this kind of crazy stuff. Yeah, that's a really cool mechanism. Thanks for diving into that. I think so basically like these 20 days like if someone has a mnemonic they can just try to register a new device but you could still block it but okay if you lost any you you wait the 20 days it'll automatically pass over just in case yeah okay so you do need to like interact a little bit with the account at least the frequently if you lost a mnemonic let's say yeah yeah so it's not perfect but the idea the idea is uh for example assuming that my phone just got uh, crashed i don't have access to it and so forth uh, then basically I still need to be able to recover this kind of, of the funds. And assuming that I do have uh, access, I'm still getting notifications all the time or I can just hear hear or listen to what the account does and so forth. Like, uh, I, I don't think that, that the ideal case would be to lose, lose, lose uh, access to the funds forever. Like, Yeah, I know exactly. Uh, there's like a sort of, okay, yeah, I think it's like you have to die one death somewhere a little bit. And I think, this is like a nice trade-off uh, that you're exploring or doing there. So, yeah, that's quite impressive. I, yeah, I really like it. Cool. I mean, yeah, thanks so much. I think we went like super deep into everything. I hope people take away uh, a lot about uh, Multiverse X and like uh, understand how much cool tech you build and like what's still to come. Is there any any final thing you want to say or you want to like lead people towards or uh, want to make them aware of what's happening or how they can get involved uh, then please let's do it yeah definitely definitely so i'm, I'm uh, i do believe that uh, th there's a lot of stuff that uh, is still to be built as i said like on the sovereign chains uh what, what there there are the first uh, i think couple of, of chains coming up line up with evm bringing evm composability 
and compatibility, then there uh, should be, uh, we're looking and uh, actively talking to several teams from Solana ecosystem to build a Solana VM, then move VM, that would be also a very cool part. And then hopefully to get one of the versions that will, will just wrap and have a unified execution environment across all those kind of queries with VMs. So what, what what if, and just open it, putting it like that, then while uh, I think to believe that uh, restaking uh, is definitely, I think, very, very crazy idea that uh, eventually kind of every ecosystem will have. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean here, big, uh, big congrats to you, Felix. Uh, I know you, you had some very, very cool, cool stuff uh, recently announced. Uh, and the whole, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll work together on that, that one as well uh, down the road. Um, yeah, and um, th there, there's a couple of stuff. I, I, I may be also very, very interesting that I have not seen yet because of those licenses that we're also having oh, with IDEN accounts. What if we're going to build a chain or a chain framework that where the banks could just spin off their spin off uh, spin on their their own infrastructure, right? So we're gonna explore with our own, put a framework together, and then work with the central bank to kind of let's see if that could be tokenized directly on chain. Or what if what if I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff, uh, assuming that legislation is is being solved, the licenses are on the table, and we do have this kind of uh, toolkit on the table. It's an open question to what what can we build like how how, how far can we go uh and that's i think uh, just a matter of time until well, the way i'm thinking the, uh, just a matter of time until uh, until whatever you're thinking i'm gonna f uh, think about it too it's just a matter of time that uh, until the ecosystem if it's progressing good enough it will get get there yeah yeah like you mentioned like the consumer grade like the core primitives consumer and then the institutional enterprise i like that framework as well so I guess you you are definitely think, uh, involved in all the <laughs> those areas. So um, just uh, let's note it. Funny enough, I just had an ecosystem call with the founders uh, uh, yesterday, and there's the Institute of Research and Engineering, I think, from the national government from Romania that is being part, and they have the, an NFT marketplace uh, running, and they're exploring with the sovereign chains. And the cool, even crazier part. The, like there's a partnership between the government, the, the uh, China government and European, several European governments, where the China one is exploring to to launch their own NFT marketplace as well for the national uh, Olympics uh, guys and and uh, exploring that. Like how how crazy it, it got. Like from from uh, talking all this kind of crazy cryptographic uh, protocols, then governments uh, finally coming closer and exploring this uh, the, the technology with nfts yeah yeah maybe soon uh, soon chinese <laughs> meme coin coming <laughs> <One hundred percent>. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see <laughs> all right yeah thanks so much i really enjoyed this and and thanks for being the first podcast in, in seven years uh, so yeah i hope the listeners enjoy this episode and yeah get in get in touch with the multiverse ecosystem so thanks a lot felix Highly appreciate the time uh, and thanks a lot for the patient guides. I know uh, it might might have been a bit tough uh, with all that stuff, but sharding will come eventually to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> nice, good final words. <laughs>